All right, everybody. So this week we're interviewing Lynn Stahl from Metalhead Minis. And we're going to be talking a little bit about figures, especially, you know, like figures that come in model kits. We're going to talk about that a little bit. And then I've got a bunch. It's mostly this stuff is some of the other topics we're going to cover. Um, so hopefully everybody enjoys the interview. And, uh-oh. Oh, there it is. Uh-oh, here comes trouble. That's why he said, uh-oh. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> We're on to you. <laughs> <laughs> right. Hello, so how's it everyone. Going? So thanks for coming on. Um, Thank there you for anything having. significant with the name Metalhead Minis? Because you've, you've got it on pretty much everything. I do. When I came up with the name and I realized I had to turn this into something like having, well, I noticed years ago when I started metalhead minis, I noticed that people who were painters and started doing it professionally and getting paid for it had a name for their studio associated with who they are and what they do. Right. So the significance of my company name when it was created was a couple of things. One, obviously I worked on minis, right? So I had to find a way to put minis and miniatures incorporated in there, right? I started painting in the 90s and in the 90s, uh, just about all models were made from pewter, rolidium. So there was some lead in there. I still turned out okay. <laughs> and then later white alloy, right? So the minis that I started off with were made of metal before resin and plastic polymers and such became more popular. And also I've been a musician my whole life, primarily doing metal since I was, I've been a musician since I was two, but I've been into metal since I was six. So I figured putting those things together, the metal, you know, cause music always meant a lot to me throughout my life, starting out with doing models and miniatures in metal and then minis. And then it just kind of rolled off the tongue a bit and it was still significant. So that was a good thing. So uh, how long have you been doing it professionally? Like you, you know, it's, it's pretty much what you've been doing for a while, right? Yeah. Since 2009, I've been painting since 1997. Well, that's cool. Mm-hmm. So an accident. <laughs> oh, accident. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. So, so if you were going to start over like with everything, you know, now, and you were going to start over penetra painting miniatures, what would you what would you tell people for paint and a little bit of supplies you would get? Like if you were going to start completely over, what well, what would you get first? I'm actually a completionist, so I pretty much just as soon as I get into everything, I buy everything. So when I, you know, so I play Warhammer also in 40k, right? So as soon as I sit there and decide that I want to play a certain army, I get Every single thing associated with that army, I get a case for that army, dice to match that army, you know, the books, everything. Uh, so I was always a completionist. Even when I first started painting, I bought the entire line of GW paints and a bunch of brushes and everything. I guess I would say if I had to start over, get what you need as you go along, which I guess most people do anyway. But if you're a completionist like me, I ended up over time with stuff that I wasn't using, with stuff that... I ended up with extra of because if I would have known that I would have along the way ran into other people or ran into events and stuff where they had or gave those things and that would be less money to have to spend, I guess. So I, I guess it's, that's the only thing I could think of. Other than that, anything I've learned along the way, I don't regret at all because then I received an education and thus was able to share it with the rest of the world later on, right, by teaching. So I don't regret any of the rest of it. How has the teaching thing been going along since COVID? Is it it's just completely different or? Yeah, it's not the same because we love having our students with us and being there for them and teaching. And it's so much better for a lot of people to have someone right there to help them. When you do the Skype 101s, that caters to certain types of learners, your visual learners, the ones who uh, are auditory learners, they're fine when you sit there and do those kind of things, the Zoom classes, the one-on-ones and stuff. 
but those who are hands-on learners, your kinesthetic learners, whatever, they're basically mostly negated throughout this whole weirdness. And you see that a lot of them are trying to adjust and get used to the fact that, okay, this is gonna be life for a while, for at least the next couple of years. So we have to find a way to adjust. And I noticed it's been rough for quite a few people. Not to mention, people want that human connection too. You know, that's why we do things like we go to restaurants, we go to bars, we go to wherever, the mall, whatever, because we want to be around people. And I know that that's something a lot of people have been missing too. So it's still been, I think that we, it, the, the process has been going by a lot smoother because now we're starting to get used to it. Now it's becoming a part of life, but there's still parts of it where it's kind of weird to navigate for certain people because they're missing out on certain aspects that are also really important for, you know, for their learning and human connection. So, okay. So do you think those mini cons or whatever you want to call them, f figure painting competitions, do you think those are going to remain the, like they were, or they're going to be a morph between the two now? I, I think that we're going to start doing, I think there's going to be a more hybrid once things become, more back to normal and everybody's starting to get the vaccines and everything else. I think there's going to be a lot more hybrid going on. I think there's going to be a lot more where there's going to be some in-person going on and there's going to be some online going on, which actually could be a really good thing. Not only because I know for the next few years, people are going to be weird about going out and being in crowded events and you can't blame them. Right. But also too, I think the good thing about this, is that this has allowed people who are, let's say, handicapped, sick, do not have the financial means to go to said events. I feel that one good thing about this is that this has allowed those people to be able to be able to participate more. Because before all that, to give you an example, so you know on my YouTube channel, one of the things that I do in the videos is I do walkthroughs of events. Which is and really I, cool, by the way. Huh? And which is really cool, by the way, because you, yeah. you get to see a lot of the stuff. And I do that for multiple reasons. I do that because there are people who are not aware of events that are going on right by them. And it could be for multiple reasons. It could be because they don't use Facebook. I know there's a lot of drama on Facebook. I don't blame you as it's fine. But it's but when it comes to businesses, that's a lot of what we use. So if you don't do much pushing, meaning the companies, the events outside of social media, such as Facebook and Twitter and YouTube and such, and you have some of those people that just don't deal with any of those things, how are they supposed to know about certain events that are going on? So when those people see that there's those events going on around them in their backyard sometimes, because I get a lot of comments like, I didn't even know this was going on. This is only happening X amount of miles away from me. It's a hop, skip, and a jump from me. I could spit on the building from my backyard, you know? And these people have no idea that these things are going on. And perhaps maybe somebody who does have YouTube and stuff sees this and is like, hey, Bob, we can go do this together next year. So I, that's one good thing about it. It helps spread the word. And also I always did my walkthroughs in such a way where it's like, it's like you're an extension of me. I walk around, I talk to everybody, I introduce you to people and it makes you feel like you're a part of what's going on. And I know that there are people that cannot go to these events for whatever multiple reasons there are. As a matter of fact, I know from experience, one of my kids who who has Asperger's cannot be, he loves people, he loves D&D, he loves gaming, but he cannot go to any crowded events. So we're both into metal together and stuff, but I can't take him to a concert. And we're both into, I mean, he's in an excellent DM also and stuff. He loves dungeon. He's like a walking D and D book. You could ask him anything. Hey, dwarf with this armor, this, this weaponry, blah, blah, blah. And he will just go down the line. Oh, blah, 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 blah. like he'll just go down the numbers and everything. He's like, you know, but he cannot go to conventions. So how do you include those people? Right? 
So yeah. it just it makes it more of a safer bubble type setting for them. But if they decide one day that there's something that fits for them. And I also like, too, that a lot of conventions are doing more things to accommodate people with social anxieties and stuff and doing things like having like Gen Con. I don't know if you saw they have more quiet rooms now. So that way, when people oh. on the spectrum go through sensory overload, for example, or just have a social anxiety in general, like they're crowded and starting to get like anxiety, they could just go into a quiet room. No, that's cool. That That's really cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think it's really great that those, but yeah, I think, you know, in the grand scheme of things, there's going to be a lot more hybrid going on. I think there's going to be more of in person. And then, hey, if you want to join online, pop, 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 go over here or do this or whatever, or you're going to have more people like myself that are going to sit there and do more to try to accommodate and let people join in. So, so you, you're going to like, you're going to buy like a figure, right? Mm -hmm. we'll get into some of the technical terms a little bit here. Like you, you pick paint. Why would you pick a miniature paint over like, we'll say craft paint? Well, for me, it's all personal preference at the end of the day. I always hated when online people would get into holy wars about paint, you know? It's like, oh, Citadel paint. And then it's like, no, Vallejo. And you see people go like back and forth, you know? It's, and that's so unnecessary. There's a reason why there are so many different brands and types of paint. And it's so that people can try different things and then people can create their own personal preference. You could absolutely paint a model with craft paint. If that's what you prefer, you like the consistency, you like the colors, and if that's what you could afford or whatever your story is, you could do that. Just uh, that make sure to clean the model with soap and water and make sure to use a good primer and you're fine. That apple barrel paint will stay on, you know? So that's, that's, not, that's a, totally fine. For me, in my case, since I do it professionally, I have to have multiple lines of paint. I actually do have clients that request certain things, or perhaps I might be, for example, continuing on painting their army, and they would need that certain brand and color of paint in order to maintain consistency. So for me, it just makes it easier for me to have those things already on hand, instead of every time I get a commission, Oh, now I got to go out and get this. I got to go out and get that. And, and, and yeah, you could do that. But for me, I'm a very busy person, so I can't always do that. But at the end of the day, it's all preference. It's all preference. Mm -hmm. See, now that's how I started is I, I just started grabbing the Apple Barrel, the Walmart brands, right? Yeah. And then I slowly moved into Army Painter because Army Painter it was a little bit closer to that. So it was really an easy transition for me. Yeah. Yeah, and, and there's different, and every, now I feel like there's started, it's starting to get to the point where there's too many brands of paint, <laughs> you know, but for the most part, a lot of them all bring something to the table. So for example, Reaper paint is great. There's so many different colors, so many options. The consistency is, is, is always great coming out of the bottle not only hand brush friendly it's also airbrush friendly and they have a good affordable price to get the paints it's not out of reach it's not oh you want to now let me tell you something you want an idea of how long i've been painting so i told you 97 right at that time the full line of gw paints if i remember right was 85 colors and it cost me when i bought the whole set something like $125. Now, if you want to sit there and get the, well, now they, they expanded their line and now they have contrast paints and this and that and the other. So fine, whatever. But before that, the last generation of paints, before they started putting in and bringing the Forge World into the some of the regular stores and all that other stuff. Now, if you want the full set of paints with the regular line, the last generation, it was something like $625. They're yeah. not everybody at $625 and be like, oh, yeah, hey, hey, you know, even the contrast paints. I pre-ordered the whole set when it first came out. I like the contrast paints. They're a lot of fun. But that whole set, it was, what is it, 30 colors or 32 when you, and then you count in the bone wraith in the, in the pot and the gray sear in the pot and then the thinner and stuff. 
and the whole the whole thing I paid like 280 or something like that. And I forgot if that includes the spray the spray cans or not, but you know what I mean? Like not everybody has like all that money to shell out just in one shot, you know? So what I've been doing is I've been like the contrast paint is really great. I mm -hmm. I I enjoyed them really good. But what I do now is I get that that mixing medium or whatever they have and then yeah. I'll add that to different colors. And that's that's how I save a ton of money. Yeah, and then and you could and you could do that. You could you could spread it out like that using thinners. I mean, usually you got to use thinners with paint all the time anyway, right? And there's different ones that you can use. If you want to use something that's more economical, uh, you could use like because it comes in bigger bottles. That's why I say that Liquitex Flow Aid. That that stuff works really good. And if you are really tight on a budget, that's totally fine. For eighty cents in a gallon you can get distilled water or you can also, and I've done, I, I do this also in a container. I will mix half Liquitex flow aid and half distilled water. There, there's different ways you can go about again, personal preference, just because I'm telling you something that I do. That's not the be all end all, you know, do, try different things. I always tell people like my new painters in the beginner classes. I always tell them, if there's a paint night going on somewhere, like at a game store, a friend's house, go because they have different stuff than what you have. Mm -hmm. So try their stuff. No one's going to sit there and think that you're going to break the bank just because you want to try out a drop of paint. And if they do, then they got bigger problems uh, that you don't need to deal with. So, yeah, there's that. But, yeah, there's different things that you could do. Always partake in those things I, is, is what I what I always tell people. Take multiple classes, even if it's on the same topic, but with a different teacher, because then you get a different perspective on the topic. So I feel stuff like that's always important to do. And 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 the cool thing is, is it's it's not wrong or right. No, it's just a direction that you're going. And exactly. You always adjust later. Yeah, and that's that goes back to the whole thing about when people get into holy wars about stuff. It's like if you firmly believe that Citadel paint is the only way to go, that is fine, but don't sit there and you you know use it as if you're proselytizing religion and shove it down someone's throat because they might not feel the same way as you. It's all personal preference. Isn't that wonderful? We have choices, you know. It's like why are you fighting? Or we'll go into the next topic, paintbrushes. Yeah. Paintbrushes is by far worse. Oh, so with the arguments people get into about oh, them. Yeah. Started on that. Like, oh, okay, forget it. No, no. Right? <laughs> like, yeah, no, no, no. It's like, no, I've seen people get into all kinds of crazy. Let me tell you something. Remember when with Windsor Newton, the series seven brushes that they sat there and they were like, oh, they're not gonna be available. Bro, I wasn't playing. I turned around and I I cleared out. Bobby's hobby when they were still open and one of my distributors, Hey, you, you got series seven. I need sizes triple zero to three, as many as you got, send them to me and invoice them. I still got a ton left. I, yeah. And it's I don't care. I like what I like. And you know, and that's the cool thing. And that's why there's like 80 billion different paintbrushes. Yeah, for sure. Broken Toad's amazing also. Oh my God. So I have one set that I got one year at Adepticon and you know how they keep sitting there and they, you know, they come out with their brushes and then they sit there and then they can't for a while. So I have like this one set that I've been like coveting like a holy, like a holy grail kind of thing. I won't use them. I won't open them. I'm just sitting there and I'm like, they're like, oh, you got Broken Toad. Yes, don't touch it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I have other broken toads that I've been using, like single one-off brushes, but like the one set that I got, I'm like, <laughs> and Monument Hobbies, I like their brushes too, uh, the synthetics especially, because they have like the ones that called the deck cords. I really like those ones. Those are great for like freehand and lining and stuff like that. So if you're looking for suggestions, people, that's why I made mention of them. Rose, Rose, Rosemary and Company too. Rose, where's that? That's that's. Yeah, Rosemary and Company is a company that sells uh, Kalinsky stable brushes. You can find them online. I think they're across the pond, if I'm not mistaken, but I could be wrong on that. 
I'm trying to remember because I get it confused the locations of some of them and I don't mean nothing by it, but whatever. Anyway, point is, so the Rosemary and Company brushes are very reasonably priced and really nice Kalinsky Sable. I've had a couple of those and actually one of them is still going strong. I mentioned that because I beat the crap out of brushes like me and GW brushes. Girl, <laughs> I beat the crap out of those brushes. I have one that's been really standing up to me and i think it's a a layering brush if i remember right and that one's been standing up to me it's like no you're not going to break me down we're not going to break me down but all the other gw brushes i use and it's not gw's fault it's all me i'm not I, i'm not even gonna lie and i'm like that with guitar picks also i rip through guitar picks like nobody's business that's why i always have to use thicker ones yeah i, I yeah so with paint brushes, there's the there's the debate about dry brushing a dry brush. Yeah. Paint brush. Oh, when some people sit there and think it's cheating, you're talking about or what? No, no, no. Like what? What's what's actually a good dry brush? Well, you can use makeup brushes. Makeup brushes are actually really good for that, and they actually, if you know where to go, they're pretty moderately priced. You can even go on websites called, such as Wish wish.com if you're familiar with it now mind you the stuff doesn't come that quick because it comes from asia well especially now i guess right because they're going through delays and they're you know everything's basically closed because of chinese new year and whatever but so but it usually it takes as long as you don't mind waiting a few weeks or whatever that that's fine just to give you an idea but yes makeup brushes can be can be good uh as for other dry brushes that i use i do use gw for dry brushes and then there's some that I get on Amazon too. If you go on Amazon and you put art brushes, you know, like paint brushes and stuff, they have like flat headed ones that are good for that too. Cause it really depends on what kind of dry brushing you're trying Tell to do. That, right? Yeah. You can get some of those on Amazon too. Yeah. 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 This is that amazing. one anyway. I have no idea. Is that a makeup I brush? I still like make my wife, so I oh, you rocking one with the crystals on it? Oh, look at you! You getting all bougie with your dry brushing? I see you. I see you. <laughs> I just, you know, trying something new. You know, no, there's nothing wrong with that. That's she, great. She doesn't use them, so <laughs> you're like, girl, you ain't using them. Whatever you want more, go to Ulta. It's fine. And then. I've been trying to use this stuff. What's a good cleaning thing for brushes? Brush cleaner? Uh, I actually, oh, you know what? I, I'll tell you the truth, which one I absolutely love. I'm not even going to lie. Monument Hobbies, Jen's Brush Goop. That the tan, like, silk puck thing? Okay, that's the Masterson's version one. Same idea, but, the, and that one has, you know, soap and conditioner in it and stuff too. The Jen's Brush Goop, though, also has, it smells like there's some kind of coconut shea butter in there or something. It actually smells pretty good. Have you never used it before? She I, I've, been been using using this stuff. Huh? I've been using this stuff because it's what? Oh, what the heck happened? You could also use some people even use minerals, you know, mineral white spirits. If you want to use a little bit of that, there's nothing wrong with that. But that you can also use, I have a video on my YouTube channel of it uh, where I've used, you know, you could even use Dawn dish soap. And I made sure to show people that so that way they don't think, like especially if they're on a tight budget or something, that they have to only adhere to using one certain kind of soap. So you could use Dawn dish soap, palm olive. You could use, you know, like I said, I love Jen's brush goop. That's from Monument Hobbies. But you can also use the Masterson's, like the puck, like you were saying. And then there's also Mona Lisa, Mona Lisa brush soap. And if you do, just get the small one. Like, don't get, don't get the big, big one. Because the small one will last you a while. Uh oh, did your computer break on you? It just totally took the picture away. I hope I can't even. I like. I don't even see you. <laughs> <gasps> Hopefully. Uh, I just came from the gym before I did this anyway. So, I mean, chances are I I'm not looking like all that cute anyway. I'm all sitting there with my privateer press beanie. You see my beanie? Isn't this awesome? <laughs> Dude, this beanie is so comfy. Like, you don't understand. Oh, so, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> so, Off World Designs, is re that they're retiring. 
So everything on their site's like 50% off. Okay. So, so yeah, I mean, that, that's cool about the, the, um, the cleaners and stuff. Yeah. Um, so, so what do you use for a clear coat and why do you choose matte instead of gloss? Matte usually just looks better. And also if you're it, okay, say you're painting something where there's blood or something on the model, wet blood, just to be clear. Right. Or if there's eyes, how are you going to show more realism if everything is all in gloss coat? I mean, I guess unless it's a water elemental, then I mean, that I guess, you know, so we have our exceptions, <laughs> but to me, so when I use uh, any sort of coating, if I'm using spray, I'll use testers dull coat. If I'm using brush on, I have uh, in bulk the Vallejo matte varnish. Okay. Okay. Or I'll use Reaper brush on sealer, which is also just as good of quality. If I'm using gloss coat, I use either Vallejo gloss varnish or GW's art coat. Huh. And the times that I use the gloss is for things like I was telling you, if say there's wet blood on an ax, if you're doing the eyes, there's wetness to the eyes, right? If you don't mat yeah. out everything else, then how is that? You know what I mean? That's not going to really add to it. It's not going to make the eyes pop. For example, it's not going to make the blood on the ax pop. Another example where I would use gloss on jewels. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, jewels have a shine to them, right? Yeah. Yeah. So why wouldn't you put gloss on it? I, <laughs> you no, know, that, that makes sense. I, I, I could see that one. I, I, I just, I just picked up the anti shine thing from army painter. I'll tell you where else that's good to use. So say for example, you only have Vallejo paint, the model color. Right. I don't know if you've ever noticed when you sit there and you paint with the model color, there tends to be a little bit of a satin finish to it. Yeah. A little bit, yeah. With it, right. Cause there's like some vinyl in there or whatever. So say you don't want that much shine in there. You could add that stuff to it that you just showed me. There oh. is also an anti shine additive that Repa sells also that you can add to a paint that has a gloss, satin, semi-gloss type finish to it once it's coated on. Now, now, do you do most of your uh, figures in in just paintbrush or do you actually use an airbrush too? No, I, I use, I the times that I use airbrush primarily is either a very large figure, a vehicle or an army. Is usually oh, you can burn through it real quick, right? Well, because I have to. You, you have to remember, I do this professionally. I have to save labor. I have to account for all of that in my cost of doing business, mm -hmm. and it affects the profit margin. If I sit there and keep doing things that slow me down, if I slow down productivity, then I can't keep things moving. I can't keep bringing in more jobs and things like that. You don't work, you don't eat. You know what I mean? No, 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 that's, no, that's true. Believe me, as fat as I am, I like to eat. Oh, <laughs> stop, you know. <laughs> yeah, tell my doctor that. Um, all right, so let's, uh, so one of the things with the channel is we're doing, so you get a model kit and you get a figure, and I, I sent you the picture, yep. but, you know, like. Yep, we did. Like, how do you get a lot of the detail to, like, pop on something that small? Well, the good thing is, is that that model that you have there, it's about, like, what you and I discussed, like an old 25 mil. Yeah. In comparison to that GW figure you showed me, which is a 32 mil heroic scale. Yeah. These, the good these. thing is about that model that you showed me, though, that smaller model, is that it has a pretty good amount of detail to start off with. So that actually gives you a good head start. Now, if you wanted to make the details pop on something small like that, you could do still at that size, depending on how how detailed are we talking about going here? Are you trying to make it good for gameplay? Are you wanting to make it a high tabletop? Are you wanting to make it display 
and you're going to put it in a case somewhere or perhaps enter it in competition? I, I would say like a step above tabletop. Okay, so that would be high tabletop basically, all right? So in those cases, the difference, for those of you who are watching, because this is a very common question, what is the difference between tabletop and high tabletop, right? When you're painting something tabletop, you just want to get the colors on it. Usually, depending on what you're playing, the minimum is three colors. So say 40K for a tournament or whatever, right? You want it to look good from arm's length. We're talking, I want to say, three feet away, you want it to look good from. So you might put a little bit of detail here and there, dot, 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 and you're good, right? High tabletop. High tabletop is where you step it up a little bit. You want it to look good from a little bit closer. We'll say from here. It doesn't have to look good from here. I mean, unless you want to put that kind of love into your figure, that, that's, a, that's up to you, right? But you want it to look good from a little closer. In those cases, you're paying a little more attention to detail. Perhaps you might do a little bit of blending or a, bit of, a little bit of layering in order to go from shadow to highlight, at least on the main surfaces. And then you would perhaps put a little more care into putting eyes on the figure, let's say. Because, for example, if you're doing tabletop, a lot of you are probably more familiar with 40K. So we'll say Astra Militarum, some Catachan. The eyes on those Catachan are so friggin' tiny, I don't know why anybody bothers. But all you have to do when you paint the face, put Reichlin Flesh Shade over for tabletop, you're good, right? However, if you're doing high tabletop, now you got to put a little more into it. So you might go so far as to do a little bit of white for the eyes and then a little bit of black to put an eyeball in there. So it's just basically the idea is you're trying to step it up a little. In the case of the model that you showed me for an example, you can easily do that. Now, if we're talking even smaller, like if we're talking 15 millimeter, if we're talking, well, even 15 mil, depending on the, uh, the amount of detail, you could probably get away with doing a little, but you can only go so far. Six mil, don't even bother. You ain't going to get nothing going on there. You can sit there and actually do a decent amount of layering or, you know, blending, depending on what you're into doing to do some highlighting on the aviation suit that is that, that that's a right it was a pilot, a pilot, pilot. Yeah. Yeah. i was just trying to i was trying to remember from the picture cuz the helmet too it's like oh it's a fighter pilot or an astronaut fighter pilot gotcha so you could still do a good amount of highlighting you could even do it with airbrush so, you would so, just have to be careful how much psi you're using because of the size of the model yeah that's for sure my my so <laughs> My my somo, sotar definitely helps with that. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> so so basically, basically you're saying is the base coat a wash, right? You can do a wash for sure. Yeah, on that. Then yeah. You, then you're gonna dry brush it, right? You can. Or do you, or do you highlight certain spots? Would that be better on something that small? With a high tabletop, you probably would be more inclined to do hand blending or some kind of layering to highlight because you want it to look a little neater. Yeah. And also though, it depends on your airbrushing. I mean, uh Oh, well, looks like Lynn froze. Um, hopefully it comes back. <laughs> Lynn, um, all righty. Well, we'll we'll give it a minute. I I mean, okay, and I'm back. I'm back. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> you know, the internet was trying was trying to to phase me. It was all like, oh, you're having fun. <laughs> it always seems to know that for you. There you go. Always seems to know that. Oh. <laughs> no, okay. So sorry. As I was saying, we'll rewind a little bit for those of you tuning in. So Josh was asking, can you dry brush on that figure for if let's say you're doing a high tabletop? Now, most of the time, I would say if you're doing high tabletop, you're probably going to want to hand blend that. Well, maybe not blend, but like layering at least, right? You want to do that by hand. I say this because 
people who do dry brushing, most of the time you could tell that's what they did. And I don't mean that in a bad way. It's just in some cases that could be more of a tabletop kind of technique to use, depending on how good you are at your dry brushing. Now keep in mind, I've been dry brushing since 1997 and back in the day, and Josh can vouch for me, with me on this, that's how you rolled. You base coated, you put a wash, you dry brushed, and then you put your seal on there, whatever you had on hand, whether it was matte or gloss or satin, it's whatever you had, and then you called it good. That was it. We yeah. did not adopt those techniques yet of the blending, the modulation, none of that. Dry I brushing, dry brushing there. the crap out of this when I'm when I get there. That is good. That is very well suited for airbrush if you're very well versed in your airbrush, and well, because on those surfaces you could do modulation and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, if you're well skilled with dry brushing, you can sit there and incorporate that into your high tabletop repertoire also, because I could dry brush to the point you can't even tell that's what I did. And 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 I I will say this. You have a Twitch channel. I do. And if if you're wanting to kind of learn a little bit, go watch it. You don't have to comment. You don't have to. I mean, yeah, if you want the video every week, you got to hit the heart thing, I think. The follow. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I stream three mornings. I, I, yeah, I usually stream three mornings a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, from uh, about 5.30 a.m. currently to 7 a.m. Now, eventually, the stream schedule might change. I don't know when there's a lot of transitioning happening and, you know, moving and remodeling and redoing and all this other stuff. So there's a lot going on. But currently, that's where we're at. Uh, for my morning job that I do, I work in logistics. We're currently all working remotely. Hence, which is another reason why currently that stream schedule still works. Eventually, we might all be going back to the building. We don't know yet when it's been back and forth. I don't know what's going on, but eventually that schedule might change. Of course, we'll keep you posted when that time comes. But currently, it's Monday, Wednesday, and Friday morning from 5.30 a.m. to 7. Yeah, and, and the crazy part is, like, I'm, I'm a real visual learner. Mm -hmm. So if I can watch people do stuff, and, and you are a really good person to, to watch, Thank you. you'll explain stuff as you're going along. Yes. And it's really, really cool. Like, I, I know I improved, like, night and day just just by spending 20 minutes watching your channel. Oh, thank you. I mean. I appreciate that. That's really good. That means I'm doing my job and I'm doing it well, and that's what I like to do. So, I, I like mean, teaching people. I mean, it sucks now. I can't watch them live because I work swing shift now, but, you know, that's life sometimes. And just so that you know, and actually uh, one of the game stores that I frequent, they were talking about that. They all, uh, Heroes Retreat in San Antonio, Texas, they all watch my my Twitch. And they were saying about, because I used to do a stream at night during the week also. But what happened was I had my foster son at the time. And that poor thing, he had so many appointments. This poor child, every day after school, he had somewhere he had to be, someone he had to see. It was just, I felt so bad for this child uh, because he was like, he never had time to just hang and just be a kid, you know, most of the time. But he had his therapy appointments on Tuesday. So I sat there and would be up since five o'clock in the morning, work all day, you know, get stuff done at the shop, pick him up and then take him to his appointment and then do the streaming until 11 o'clock at night to have to get up at five and do it again. So it was just like, it was just too tiring. So I did used to do during the week at night, but basically, so the guys at Hero Retreat were like, yeah, we love watching your thing, but you know, we don't get to see it until later. So I just want you guys to know, and when I told them this, I guess nobody thought about it. If you end up watching my streams after, for whatever your reasons are, your schedule, you don't like getting up at the crack of ass like I do, that's totally fine. I'm not offended. If you have questions when you see something on the stream, please feel free to message. I have people that message all hours international, national, it doesn't matter. And if they're not like trying to place an order, book a job or whatever, it's to ask me questions about painting. Hey, I saw something on your YouTube video. I was wondering, ba, ba, ba. So there's different ways you can contact us. 
So, so on what though? Facebook? I'm gonna, that, I'm gonna tell yeah, you oh. can definitely cut. Josh, come on, have you met me? <laughs> no, yeah. you can contact, <laughs> you can message us through Twitch. Obviously, not Twitch. Uh, yeah, through Twitch, actually. Yeah, you can message us through Twitch. Uh, we're also in conjunction with the Paint Pit on Discord. So if you're part of the Paint Pit on Discord, actually, I have a room in there. There's a Metalhead Minis room in the Paint Pit. And that's the one that's run by Impending Duff and Gamer Dad, if you're not familiar. I used to have a specific Metalhead Minis Discord and we have been getting asked about doing that again. But what happened was I did it and there were so many Discord channels. So it wasn't really gaining traction. It was as if there was too much competition and I didn't feel that was necessary. So I didn't want people to feel like, hey, I painted a mini and they have to like now post it to 20 different places because we all have our own Discord. So what I did was I joined with Paint Pit and Metalhead Minis has its own channel room and you can message there too. You can also message us through the website there's a contact us page. You don't have to just use it because you want to book a commission or you want to book me for a magazine article or an interview or whatever. You can ask me questions about painting there too. People do all the time. We're on Facebook. We're on Twitter. We're on Instagram. Instagram is at metalhead underscore linsanity. So there's all different places that you can reach me. And if you saw something on a video or a stream or whatever, and you want to ask me about it or talk about it, we could totally do that. There are people that also send me pictures of something that they're painting and they're like, Hey, what do you think? And we discuss, and there's nothing wrong with that. You know? So I guess, I guess it was a matter of me telling people, yes, I am available. Please feel free to talk to me. <laughs> this is it. I don't want people to be afraid to talk to me, you know? Yeah. I, I know there for a while we were, we were talking quite a bit cause you know, I like, I I'm, I shouldn't say this, but I watch the watch it while I'm driving to work. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, but, I mean, it's 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 still you know like I, I can multitask pretty well, but I do too. Probably but OCD. I don't recommend that either because sometimes it's dark and yeah, I've I've gotten pulled over a couple times for that, but oh yeah. But it's Lynn. I'm watching Lynn. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but that excuse doesn't work, by the way. Ugh. One day, one day, maybe I'll get there. My star will rise. My coolness stock will rise. And then when you get pulled over, you'll be like, but I'm watching Lynn. All right, keep going. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Let's just put the screen down lower. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't help. Um. I tried. But anyway, um, I I really didn't have any more questions, and I tried to keep these to about an hour. That's Was fine. there anything you wanted to ask me? Well, why don't you talk about some things that you've been working on? I yeah, I I have squirrelitis lately, so um, I think that most of us are guilty of that. I have a shelf of shame that. It's very shameful I because because I don't only have a shelf of shame. I have shelves of shame and a cabinet of shame. So there's a lot of shame happening because of squirrel itis. Yeah. I mean, this has been, this has been the latest one I've been kind of working on. I, Oh, that one's nice. Where's yeah, that yeah. model from? Um, do you know the D and D whiz kid stuff? Oh yeah. That's a big yeah. one. Yeah. I mean, it's so nice. So I, I really enjoy these. They come prime, so I don't have to prime them. I just, I can sit in front of the TV and just hammer through one of these over a weekend or, and a lot of this, I mean, these are the silver and the gold. I think on this one are from mm -hmm. the new army painter metallic set. Okay which has been a really cool set. Um, oh, what the heck? What'd you do? I don't know. <laughs> it's not me this time. My internet's going. Yeah, we're, oh, where'd we go? See, and this is, this is some more of that metallic paint from the, from the army. Oh, I so they come out with different oh. colors. Okay, that's right, yeah. I have that Optimus Prime figure too. Oh, I, I went down the rabbit hole. I got Megatron. 
Oh my God. Jelly. Starscream. And then I got. That is awesome. I love it. So. You should make some of those in Turbo Dork too. Oh, the metallic paints? Yeah. That, that's a fairly new company, right? Um, About two, two or three years old now. Yeah. Yeah, fairly new company. It seems like they're they're growing. It seems like a lot more of the artists are. A lot more of the artists. A lot more stores are carrying them. They're really great. I, I Turbo Dork. I, I I'll tell you the truth. I can't say enough good things about them. I was actually introduced to them by Yeji from Snickernack Studios. She met them before I did, and she was sitting there telling me she was like, "Hey, we were at LVO a couple. It was like a couple of years ago now, right?" And she sat there and she said, have you ever, yeah, didn't you see the Turbo Dork paints? They had them in the swag bag or something. And I said, no, no, I didn't know. She's like, yeah, they have these metallic paints. They're really, really nice. And I said, oh, yeah, let me see, you know. And then I ended up being introduced by her to the owners. They're out of L.A. And they are, it's, a, it's a basically a family-owned business. And it's a, a couple and then the guy's mom, which we who we all call mom, and she's wonderful. She is just a fabulous lady. And they came out with what they wanted to do was they wanted to address the whole thing of having a wide range choice of metallic paints that have a good finish on them. So the good thing I like about Turbador paints, besides the fact that there's this wide, wide range of choices of colors, and there's so many colors, some of which you can't find nowhere, all right? Besides, let alone the fact that they have the turbo shift, you know, color shift. Now, now you can't use because then you get hammered on and they're probably going to come after me now because I said color shift. Fine, I said it. I don't care. Come after me. I'm armed with my attitude. So anyways, turbo shift, you know what I mean? So they came out with a bunch of those and the other colors. And what I love about them is that the finish, when you paint them on, it's, it's not like it's a matte finish. It's not like it's too high gloss it's that right amount of finish to really make those metallic colors pop and really make it look like good metallic color which saves you a lot of work in the long run because when you want to do things like true metallic metal there's a lot of work that gets put into that glazes and washes and all kinds of stuff yeah and and the purple color yeah, I think it's purple the, that purple I think it, it might even be the the light purple, but it's got that it, like it shifts a little bit as mm -hmm. as it's going on. Mm -hmm. I that color to me would be the only color I would get out of it first. There's but. so many good ones. There's so many good ones. Miami, they have ones that it's like got very eight. That's another thing I like about it too is that when they did the logo, they made it like really eighties. But they have like some colors that are really eighties and nineties. And if you're wanting to do the whole neon thing it's just they have such a good range of colors and the quality of paint yeah it's a little on the pricier side but i swear to you they're worth every penny they really are and airbrush friendly just clean out your airbrush well after which you have to do with any metallic anyway to get the flake out but that's yeah they're airbrush friendly obviously you know usually with any sort of color shift type you want to use airbrush primarily anyway, but you can use handbrush also. And I made sure to do that to show people that you can, because not everybody has an airbrush and not everybody can afford one right away. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I'm not going to lie. I take advantage of the Ken sale, the birthday sale. I don't so blame you. I get I, it. I've gotten some pretty good air deals on airbrushes the last. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, to be honest with you, anytime, Guys, anytime you go to conventions and you see Badger is at the convention, that is the time to buy stuff. Now, mind you, if you can only buy things online, we do have a discount code that you're very welcome to use, and it's Metalhead Minis, all one word. And that gives you 10% off. The only time that it doesn't work is if they have a big sale going on, because then the sale that they have would beat out what the discount code would give you anyway. The stuff on the website's already discounted, but let me tell you what happens when he goes to conventions. He usually ends up selling the stuff at wholesale. Oh, the last day or whatever, or the whole Well, convention. especially the last day, but the thing is, is that everything's already wholesale priced 
for Thursday, Friday, Saturday, wow. assuming that's when the event's taking place, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Friday, Saturday, wh whatever, whatever you're into. Anyway, point is you still want to buy stuff then because everyone's getting in on those deals. And then by the time Sunday comes, I'm telling you right now, I'm not lying. Ain't shit left. Well, and, and most of the time those conventions are like a week. So by the time Friday rolls around, he's got to go back to the warehouse. He does. He does. He he runs out of stuff that fast. There's been times he sold out of stuff on Thursday or at Adepticon. If he already sets up his booth at night, usually people are already sitting there crowding around trying to buy his compressors. And, and thank God, you know, Adepticon already takes place in Chicago. Otherwise he'd be... Yeah. Because when it when that's not the case, stuff has to get shipped to him. So that saves a lot of, you know, the whole logistical craziness or whatever. But yeah, that man sells out of stuff quick. So don't sit there and think for one minute, oh, I'll just wait till Sunday. Cause your ass living in a fool's paradise. Cause all that's gonna be left, all the all the Steinal Res Prima colors that you probably aren't gonna need right away or whatever. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty much all that's gonna be left. So yeah, be green one, right? <laughs> Well, make no mistake. Let me tell you something. Those Steinal res he now has in a bunch of colors. Make no mistake. Those are great colors. And there's so much that you can do with them. Mm -hmm. Like the light skin one, the dark skin, the blue, the ocean blue, the pink, the, you know, the metallic ones, especially if you play games like 40 K and stuff, games that consist of armies, horde armies, whatever, make no mistake. Those Steinal res primers are really, really useful. And they're really good colors. And they're just that right kind of color, too. I mean, whoever he had sit with him, do those colors, did a really good job. Even with the neutral yellow, because you all you got to do in some cases, if you can think outside the box and you're well-versed in your color theory, you can sit there and take those for your base and then do things like add inks and washes and stuff and really add to it and get to the color that you want, get to where you want to be with painting your army quick and easy. And Steinal Res Primer is very durable. It's very, it's it's more yeah. affordable per dollar per ounce than a lot of its other competitor counterparts. I'm just saying, you know. And and he sells them in different bottles and all kinds of stuff. Like Black, white and gray, we always have in the big bottle. We do have some in smaller bottles for travel purposes, because you know, at one point in time, before this whole COVID thing happened, I was working 18 to 23 conventions a year. So just about every other weekend, I was out and I was traveling. I was somewhere, so I had to have the smaller. But most of the time, you'll see in the shop, even the terracotta one, which is great for terrain and stuff like that. I have all the big bottles because I'm telling you, dollar for ounce. It's it's a good deal. It really is. And it's durable and it's self levels. Just like when you use the GW sprays. I love my GW sprays. Don't get me wrong. I really do. But like they don't have them in every single color that I need. A lot of them they discontinued, you know, whatever. Like Averlyn Sunset. Oh my God. Shame on you, GW. Please bring Averlyn Sunset back in a spray. Yeah. Because I... <laughs> that is a gorgeous yellow color. That is a gorgeous yellow color. And they discontinued it. I was like, oh, so I bought every one that was left at my local. <laughs> you just have a tab going at this point, right? Girl, but no, I just, well, no, I just, I, that's what I do. Like if I sit there and I know I like something, you know, it's just, if that's what I like it. And if, as soon as I hear it's going to be discontinued, oh, excuse me, I'd like to clean you out of your stock, please. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm not trying to end up on an episode of Hoarders or anything, but if I know I'm going to end up using it, because I'm sure, you know, I get commissions in for like painting 40K armies all the time. I painted Imperial Fist before. I'm sure it's not going to be the last time I'll ever do it. And Averlyn Sunset was a godsend when I was painting Imperial Fist. So. Oh, I, I can imagine. I It's just, it's just crazy. And... Some of those colors, once you add it, and then you add like a little bit of a shade or or wash to them, yeah, they, there's just like it can make it as soon, as soon as you always look, guys. Seriously, always experiment. If there's some models that you don't give a crap about, 
keep them so that you can experiment and try different things because you'd be surprised you sit there and you might look at a color a certain way and be like oh but that's a really bright yellow but you'd be surprised that if you experiment and try different things like say you take yellow and you put a sepia wash over it or you take yellow and you use a dark brown type oil wash over it you'd be surprised how much different you can make that one color look you could take that one color and you can create so many different looks with it you just have to experiment and not be afraid to try different things that's what it comes down to but have fun with it it's art mm -hmm. there there's you know there's things there's techniques and there's ways to do certain techniques, but at the end of the day, there's no rules, especially now where us doing art is good for our mental health. The last thing we need is a rigid set of rules to go along with that. Just do your art, no rules. You know, in the words of Banshee, if, if I may, the, the whole, what was it? The, if I, is that okay? The F smoothness campaign or whatever. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> So, you know, forget smoothness, whatever. I know it's a little different once you get into competition or whatever, but right now, just just do your art, just enjoy it. That's just have fun with it. That's what I'm gonna tell you. Cause if you're not having fun, then what's the point? Yeah, it, it, that's a perfect example. And I, I, I do more than just figures. I do model planes. I've got my 3D printers now. I, yeah, it's, it's, it's the rabbit hole that just got way too big sometimes. Oh yeah, for sure. But definitely. Yep. Just have fun with it. No rules. Screw around and have a good time. Now's the time, especially, you know, I think you could do that all the time, but yeah, now, now, especially. Yeah. You know, well, anyway, I, I try to keep these to an hour cause. Uh, yep. We're almost that. We're almost in an hour. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to say thank you for coming on. Thank you for having me. I will uh, talk to you in couple minutes. Okay. Okay. I'm going to end this. All right, everybody. So that was Lynn Stahl from Metal Hen Minis. Hopefully you learned something like I did today. Um, and I will see you next time. Bye.